word beatitude really comes from the word blessed saying. Blessed saying. And Jesus gave about eight blessed sayings in Matthew chapter 8, excuse me, Matthew chapter 5. Now, I put a little ghetto play on words here. So to me, beatitudes, all right, is how your attitude ought to be as I get my bottle of water. How your attitude ought to be. What should my attitude be like in a season such as this? Because let's talk, let's talk straight today. We all are happy, joy, full of good intentions, hope, and wishes when everything's going great in our lives. You couldn't have told us we'd be here this past December or January. This time last year, you couldn't have told us 12 months from now, the world, not just Charlotte, not just North Carolina, but the world will be in such a place that no one would have predicted. Matthew 5, let's read. Verse 1, and seeing the multitudes, he went up on a mountain, and when he was seated, and that's why I'm sitting down, by the way, when he was seated, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the pure in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall shall be filled. Now, if you've been with me for the last week and a half, two weeks, we've covered those first six Beatitudes. Let's pick up with number uh, seven and eight tonight, uh, this morning, verse seven. Blessed are the merciful, for they should obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. And blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. One more blessed. Blessed are you when they revile you, when they persecute you, and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my name's sake. Now, if you see yourselves in at least one or two of them, just raise your hand and let me know you're in the house today, all right? All right, I only got about five people. Everybody else is just living a great, straight, no problem life. Uh, if in one of those six, seven, eight areas, just wave a hand to me. Let me know you're in the house, all right? Real good. All right. Um, let me do this. Go to Luke. Stay, I mean, stay in Matthew, but go to Luke. Uh, uh, yeah. Matthew, Mark, Luke, the synoptic gospels. Mark saw it a certain way. Matthew saw it a certain way. And Luke saw it a certain way. Then let's see how Luke saw this. Go to Matthew. Uh, let's look at chapter 6. Matthew, I'm, I'm sorry, thank you so very much. Luke, go to Luke, and I want to read this one more time. And uh, uh, what chapter did I say? Thank you, chapter 6. Let's start at verse 22, Matthew 6, 22. Are you there yet? Luke, I'm sorry, thank you so much. Luke, <laughs> Luke, chapter 6, verse 22. Okay, everybody ready? Let's go. Blessed are you when men hate you. Wow, Lou. Thank you, sir. <laughs> and when they exclude you and revile you and cast your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake, rejoice in that day. In fact, leap for joy. Hallelujah. For indeed your reward, come on, say my reward. Come on, say my reward. Your reward is great in heaven. For just like they did to your fathers, they did to the prophets. For in like manner their fathers did to the prophets. If somebody's hating on you right now, you're in good company. Now, I hate to sound so naive when I say this, but years ago, I didn't think nobody hated me. I didn't think nobody had the potential of hating me. I ain't did nothing wrong to nobody. I've done nothing to, to bring shame or scorn or embarrassment on my name. Years ago, I just figured, man, you know, hey, I'm, I'm living the life, man. I, everybody my friend. Look how many friends I got on Facebook. Look how many followers I got on Instagram. Man, the world is my oyster. But, uh, but how many of y'all know in 2020, there's some folk who, who, who hate me? And guess what? There's some folk that hate you. Some of it is their fault, and some of it's our fault. But to Jesus, this was nothing new. He said out of his own mouth, 
You are blessed when people hate you. It's not enough to hate somebody, Brother Nixon. They said that they would reject you. I, I don't know if you're reading the Bible when you read the Bible. Blessed are you when they exclude you. Luke sees this thing a little different than Matthew does. Let me talk for the next few moments today. And again, I cannot spend a lot of time reviewing because we've gone through this for two whole weeks. I want to focus on these last four or five and close out the series on today. Uh, we live in difficult days. You know that already. Stress, anxieties, fears, phobias, uncertainty, unknown, insecurities. That's all of the uh, highlights of our day and time. But I reminded you last week, and I'll say this again. For every fear in today's world, there's hope in God's word. For every worry and concern, there's an answer that comes through prayer. For every uncertainty, every unknown, every insecurity, let me remind you today that God has a purpose, God has a plan, and God has power for your life. These beatitudes are blessed sayings for the next few moments. It's really a gut check of how your attitude should be when you're hated on, when you're rejected, when you're persecuted. This is how your attitude should be when people overlook you, talk bad about you, and instead of fighting fire with fire or rendering evil for evil, Jesus says, let me give you some instructions on not only how your attitude should be, but let me tell you the reward you will have if, someone say if, come on, if you follow what I'm saying. And so Matthew 5, Israel was too in a very seemingly fight for their lives, and they were in the fight of their lives. There was Roman governmental oppression and rule, overtaxation, underrepresentation. Israel was dealing with persecutions, prejudices, and discriminations. On top of that, the civil unrest led to more times of being uneased. Things were hostile, out of control, anarchy. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? If that wasn't enough, there were sicknesses, disease, infirmities, and it was a much needed time of healing. How do we know this? Well, in chapter 4, before we get to chapter 5's beatitude, what does chapter 4 close out on? Jesus was healing of diseases, of sicknesses, and infirmities. And the Bible says anybody who got close to Jesus got healed. The crowds, the multitudes, those who followed him, Matthew 4.23, Matthew 4.23, they all got healed. So this is nothing new, the season that you and I are experiencing right now. We call this the Sermon on the Mount. Why is it a Sermon on the Mount? Because he taught it from the side of a mountain. When you go to Capernaum, we use the word Capernaum, when you go to Capernaum, right in that region in the northern part of Galilee, you'll see easily where he could have sat at the bottom of the mountain and the crowd was up on the mountain and he had a natural built ecosystem of an amphitheater. So he didn't need the sound system. He didn't need a lapel mic. He could easily talk, and a crowd of thousands could hear him. I noticed something Luke said, and let's go back to Luke just six, just real quick. I won't take a lot of time, but, you know, Luke saw something that Matthew didn't bring out. Look back at Luke six, just for one moment, and, 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 and watch this. I love this. I love this part. Verse 17, and he came down with them, and he stood on a level place with a crowd of the disciples and a great multitude of people from Judea, Jerusalem, from the seacoast of Tyre and Sidon, who came to hear him and be healed of their diseases, as well as those who were tormented with unclean spirits. They all were healed. Let me talk to you just for a moment here. Stay with me, stay with me. It's not just sometimes about the physical sickness or the physical infirmity. Yes, we see the, the, the demise of COVID-19. We're almost at 150,000 people. But what about the mental illnesses, the emotional struggles, the, the darkness, the depression? You know, I'm praying for our friend Kanye. He's going through some public bouts with bipolar. He's gifted. He's anointed, I believe. But, the boy, excuse, but he needs to take his medicine. All right, quit going off on his family on, on Twitter and Instagram. They told us months and months and months ago that the combination of civil unrest and racial uh, uh, discrimination and, and, and all of the things we're seeing on that end combined 
with the uncomfort of being quarantined combined with the fear of people being sick and dying would conclude in a mental struggle, particularly for people of color. And so Luke says, what did Jesus do? He came down on their level and he sat with them. One of the reasons I'm teaching on the floor in this season was just to be an illustration. He's not high up in the pulpit. He's not high up in the grandstands or the press box. Kind of like David in the Old Testament. David was ready to mount his horse and fight with his men. That's all David knew. David was rough. He wasn't your little cute, churchy, boy type, you know, uh, semi-feminine leader in the church. David, David was rugged. And the Bible says he mounted his horse to fight with the men. And they said, hold up, David. You are now worth 10,000 of us. For if they flee us, no, it won't matter. But if they flee you, all of us are going to be destroyed. And so Jesus understands now is the time to sit among the people. I'm in a season right now, we had a wonderful, and thank you, Pastor Tim and Sister Vanessa and, 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 and Elder Hall, who's online today, and, and Sister Felicia and, and the team. We sat yesterday and had a wonderful discussion of where should the church be right now? Where should the church be 90 days from now, 30 days from now? What type of impact, influence, uh, response should we be having in this time of crisis? I've already made some phone calls, by the way. So whatever we decide to do for this community or for Charlotte, everybody's going to know it. Billboards, radio, um, social media, and the like. Because we want this church to be known for being a church that responds in crisis. We're not tucking our tail between our legs, riding out the storm and waiting for things to get better. We need to be like the David leader who said, we on the floor. We want to be just like Jesus who says, you know what? It ain't about just the press box. We're not just here in the war room, but let's sit among the people and let's talk. Ezekiel said, I have sat where you sit. And I pray these next few weeks, months, that you see from my wife and I first, from our elders, our pastors, our deacons, our leaders, praise team, everybody, that we have made a collective spirit-led decision to position this church in the most impactful and responsive way we can. Not for headlines, not so we can be interviewed, but may people say, that church, Okay? And you know what I'm going to say? Let me take it a step further. I'm proud to say that that black church. Right? Because sometimes it bothers me every time I see all of the humanitarian works on TV. It's always us with the hand out and always somebody else doing the giving. <laughs> Makes me wonder, are we in third world uh, country? Or are we here in America? And the media, they're very intentional. And you know that, Tammy. They're very intentional. They love to show us receiving. Like we back in the 30s and 40s. And they love to show others giving. Part of the psyche. Just like when we commit a crime, our picture stays up a little bit longer. Gold teeth, dreadlocks and all. They commit a crime, the picture stays up just half a second. I always say to myself, so-and-so robbed the bank, so-and-so murdered, so-and-so, and they don't show no picture, must have been white. You know, uh, here I go meddling again. Uh, here I go again, y'all. Y'all shouldn't ask me all these questions. Uh, let me get back on target. Pastor, stay on target. I believe I have people praying, Pastor, just stay on target. Stay. I am on target. I hope I'm making you uncomfortable. What I'm saying is detrimental to your ignorance. Think with me just for a moment. We want to make sure that uh, the church is seen being a blessing. You know, we started going to Africa years ago, years ago. And my, if my wife is here today, she'd tell you, she was quite surprised not everybody in Africa is poor and sitting on the corner uh, uh, homeless and no clothes on. There's some money in Africa. There's some resources, and I'm not just talking about natural resources either, right? The, the, the media and the imagery and the perception. And for years they would start saying, well, when are some of our black brothers and sisters going to come to Africa and help us out? When are they going to come and fellowship with us? And that's part of the reason why we kept going again and again and again. 
so we can show them that, 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 hey, we just brothers and sisters from a different mother, that's all. But we're still from the motherland. And we're not here to hand out as much as we're here to engage and minister one to another. Are you with me still? Let's get back on the Beatitudes real quick. I, I, I got to move fast through this one, all right? So, so let's get started. So Beatitudes 1 through 4. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. He goes against pride, goes against position, goes against power and says, listen, you really want to be blessed? You want to be really rewarded? Be humble. Recognize the need for God. Two, blessed are those that mourn, for they shall be comforted. It's sympathizing and mourning with the afflictions of others, mourning with those that weep. I know we're glassy, glossy civilization and society of people, but every once in a while you should be seen weeping with one another, crying with one another, mourning with one another. I know we need to get up and go on and act like things didn't happen. We people of faith. But there's nothing wrong with sympathizing with one another when you see a Breonna Taylor, when you see a George Floyd. Okay, whether they were right or wrong, somebody lost a mother, somebody lost a wife, somebody lost a son. Can you grieve with them? Can you mourn with them? Because you know what? You lose a loved one, you're going to want everybody to stop what they're doing for seven days and have a national day of mourning for your child, as bad as he was. Okay? So the point I'm making is this, blessed are those who mourn, but when your day comes, somebody will be there to comfort you, right? Number three, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. The word meek is not to be synonymous with weak. So for, I think for too long we thought that Christians should be weak and be blessed. Jesus didn't mean to be weak. Meek simply means to be kind, to be hospitable, to be courteous, to be considerate. The meek also are those who can put up with the provocation. They can put up with the abuse. They can put up with the attacks, but yet still find a way to fall on bended knees, to seek the Lord, to be found in prayer. Blessed, number four, are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. I gave you Psalm 42, 1 and 2 last week. As the deer panted for the water brooks, so thy soul panted, longest desires after thee, O God. In the New Testament, John 6, 35. And Jesus said to them, I am your bread. I am your water. He who eats uh, or shall, shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst again. Now, I won't have time to go into all of this, but the Bible says when you hunger and thirst for righteousness, okay? We hunger and thirst for money. We hunger and thirst for position and power and prestige. Jesus said, can you hunger for righteousness? Can you hunger for knowing that you're in right standing with God? Now, again, there's man's righteousness, there's uh, uh, self-righteousness, and then there's God's righteousness. In other words, make sure you don't succumb to self-righteousness. Because if you judge yourself, if you, if you compete or compare yourself with others, the Bible says that's not wise. You'll always find somebody that's a little bit more righteous than the other. But there'll always be somebody else, right, who's living a life a little bit better than you. So the Bible reminds us in Isaiah 64 that our righteous works are as filthy rags. What are you saying? On your best day on your most holiest day, on your most righteous day, on your most sanctified day, you are still, Bible said, as filth and rags, right? Because true righteousness can only be found in him. You all remember Romans chapter 10. In fact, pretty much the whole book of Romans, you had those who were looking for righteousness according to man's standards. They were trying to dot every I, cross every T, try to do things to stay in the law. And Jesus said, forget man's righteousness, I and now your righteousness, and he calls you righteous. I, I, I struggled with that for a moment until I realized, wait a minute, you call Noah righteous, and Noah was a drunk. You call Abraham righteous, and Abraham had some issues with telling the truth. You call Moses righteous, and Moses was still killing folk from time to time out of his anger. But he calls you righteous, why? Because he speaks those things that are not as though they are. He is prophesying foretelling, speaking to the man or woman you are called to be. Before Abraham ever had a belief that God could do this, Abraham took a chance and said, you know what, what do I have to lose here? I'll believe him. And what does the Bible say? God accredited him righteousness. You want to know how you're going to make it through COVID-19? How you're going to make it through the civil unrest? 
How are you going to make it not sure about your money and income and unemployment and how the bills are going to get paid? You have to walk by faith when it is not a popular thing to do. How are you going to deal with the baby mama drama? How are you going to deal with sibling rivalries? How are you going to deal with people not understanding you? You'll have to take an act of faith. And God will give you on credit righteousness until you fill into the gap, right? I got to keep moving. Number five, blessed are the merciful. We didn't pick this up last week, but I need to talk about it real quick. Blessed are the merciful, for they should obtain mercy. Listen closely to Matthew chapter 6, 12, and 15. Listen closely. Forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. Lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will forgive you. Watch this. But if you do not forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father won't forgive you. Let's pause for a moment. It's only 11.30. I'm halfway finished. Let's pause for a moment. Because as I preach this to you early in the week, I got I to I take inventory of myself. God, is there anybody out there that I have not forgiven? Is there anybody out there who's gotten under my skin, who's just made me upset, and I just can't wish for them to go to hell? Is there anybody out there that I'm just hoping and wishing and praying that they get theirs one day? Is there anybody who's violated me, talked against me, treated me a certain kind of way? And am I harboring thoughts, feelings, issues? Because unforgiveness is the silent killer. Uh, stay with me. Unforgiveness is hoping the pilot crashes the plane and you forget you on the fifth row of the plane. It's a silent killer. And some of us are bitter because of unforgiveness of something that was done 20 years ago. May I pause for a moment? Because I need you to ask yourself the question I'm asking myself. Before I go preach and holler and tell everybody how great the word is, what about in my own life? Is there anybody right now I need to forgive? Let me take it a step further. We want to look way out yonder. Somebody way back 30 years ago, 15 years ago, uh, look in your own house. Have you forgiven your husband? Have you forgiven your wife? Have you put that to bed of what happened with your teenager, your father, your mother? What about forgiving your sister? Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. However you measure it out is how you're going to get it back. It's amazing how a lot of times we want to be so hard on other people, so quick to judge. Y'all not talking to this preacher today. It's amazing how we can be so quick and so rigid and so coarse, especially some of us out of the old Pentecostal apostolic church, Boy, we lay the hammer down on people. But yet when it's your time to need a little mercy, you expect heaven and earth to pause for 30 days for you to get the healing you need. Blessed are, uh, uh, I hear my old pastor talking now. Come, come on, just say it with me. Just say it with me. Lord, help me to be more merciful. Come on, say it again. Say, Lord, help me to be more merciful. Come on, say that I may obtain mercy myself. All right, all right. Colossians chapter 3, listen to this verse of Scripture, verse 12. Therefore, the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness. Sound like to me, Paul had read something about the Beatitudes himself. Long-suffering, bearing with one another, forgiving one another. And if anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, you must forgive them. And nobody's saying amen, I see. Oh, we need so much mercy. Oh, we need so much forgiveness. And the funny thing is, we want people to forgive us and forgive us in the next 30 seconds and act like it never happened in the first place. But yet, you'll hold a grudge for some two years. How do you know? You won't call them. You won't email them, won't text them, won't come by to visit them, won't check on them. Yet, you say you bless highly favored of the Lord, but yet, you got unforgiveness in your heart. And, and you know what? We had a, a, a lady on the phone on that, on that conference this past Wednesday. Wednesday. I, I made a mistake and called her a psychologist. And she was quick to remind me, I'm not a psychologist. I'm a psych psychiatrist. I said, well, hey, look, it sounds the same to me. It's all the same to me. It don't matter what you are. But a psychologist, <laughs> I kept my cool. Because, you know, one thing about being on Zoom, you can't show no emotions. 
Because they recording that bad boy. And they will come back and say, look at his face. Look at his attitude, right? So she reminded me. She probably watching right now. <laughs> I am not a psychologist. I am a psychiatrist. I have a medical degree, and I subscribe prescription. Well, sister, let me tell you one. I don't care if you uh, Dr. Jack Kevorkian right now. I'm here to, no, I didn't say that to her. What I'm saying is, uh, what was I saying? Okay, um, uh, mercy, 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 obtain mercy. What was that? Healing, forgiveness, psychiatry, psychology, psychiatry. Uh, uh, number six, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the pure in heart. I, what, what, was I, what, what point was I getting to? I don't even remember what point I was getting to. It must have been real good, right? It, it come back to me after a while. All right, all right, here we go. So blessed are the pure in heart, for they, they're going to see God. You know, there's a scripture we used to fight over years ago in college at A&T, and that was a scripture, uh, 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 to all, all things are pure to him that is pure. And man, the self-righteous folk used to hate the folk who walk by grace, right? To the pure, all things are pure. And man, we, we, we argued over, could, could Christians drink soda? Could, 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 you know, could, should we wear pants or makeup or, or skirts? I mean, we found all type of trivial stuff. And the argument that the great folk kept giving was, well, blessed are the pure in heart. Uh, or, or better yet, uh, to the pure, all things are pure. Well, that sounded good until they end up falling themselves because there were parameters and there should have been some, some, some boundaries. And you just can't leave it up to your internal subjective self. Paul says, I, I, I put no confidence in this flesh. Nothing in me dwells good things in this flesh. So we have to have the word. We have to have accountability. We have to have uh, conviction through the Holy Ghost. Because if, if it's up to us, we're going to mess up every time. Jesus said, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. I want to know right now, can you see God in this season? Conversation we were having was simply this. Maybe God is using COVID-19 to push the church outside the four walls. Many people agree that this is the most evangelistic advantage time in the history of the world. Maybe God is getting us out of our comfort zone of everything we've ever known in our culture of church. And it's not easy for a lot of us the older, the more rigid, the more traditional, the more we got to climb a mountain to see all of this. But blessed are the pure. Uh, Psalm 24, here's the beautiful verse, verse 3. Who may ascend to the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in the holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted his soul to an idol, nor sworn deceitfully. When God says, blessed are the pure in heart, they shall see God. The objective is to see God in revelation. See God in righteousness. See God in reward. See God in riches. What are you saying? When you're walking pure before the Lord, you can't give, there's no room for the devil to tempt you. No room for the devil to deceive you and to seduce you. When you're pure in heart, you're able to see God in a lot of things. You're able to see hope when others can't see hope. Have faith when others don't have faith. Even a child or a, a situation where it's just horrible, ugly, and detrimental. When you're pure in heart, you're able to see beyond the veneer of somebody acting up or somebody out of line and see through that and know, man, they're crying out for help. They're crying out for some attention. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. My prayers, God, every time I read the Bible, let me see Revelation. God, every time I meet, meet a minister or, or minister or see somebody, let me sense your righteousness that I am in right standing with God. Number seven, blessed are the peacemakers, for they should be called the sons of God. Now notice real quick, okay, I'm almost finished. Get two more after this. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they should be called the sons of God. Peacemakers were really those who were looking for peace between God and man. I know we like to think about man and man. Hey, I'm going to be the peacemaker between brother so-and-so and brother so-and-so. Let's go to Starbucks. Let's get a latte. Let's sit down and let's try to reason this thing out. That's not, that's not what the Bible meant. It wasn't peace between man and man. Blessed are those who bring peace between man and God. So every time you witness, every time you share your faith, every time you pray with someone, pray for someone, every time you try to reconcile, right? Not so much man to man, but man to God. God says, I will bless you. I will reward you. Stay with me. I'm almost finished. Stay with me. Stay with me. 
I will bless you. I will reward you. I want to really do you good because you have a heart to see people at peace with me. This week, you're going to run into a complete stranger, and this scripture is going to come across your mind. Can I help this man? Can I help this woman be a little bit more peace with God? God says, I'll bless you if you're willing to make the attempt. Number eight, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. For theirs is the kingdom. Now, that's not the first time we've heard that. In fact, Beatitude 1 was the kingdom as a reward. Uh, Matthew circles back for the second time and says, you know what? When you are being persecuted for doing what's right, God says, I'm going to give you a kingdom. I cannot pray the prayer, thy kingdom come, that will be done, without asking myself daily, what does the kingdom mean? A place of rule, regal, royalty, dominion, power. But it also means mercy, compassion, uh, 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 hum humility. So God says, I'm going to confer a kingdom upon you. Don't think always money, big things, big happenings, big events. No, no, no. Kingdom also means compassion, kindness, and mercy. In order to get that reward, God says, listen, you're going to be persecuted for righteousness sake. Now, I have to say this because, again, sometimes we become the victim here and we want everybody to empathize with us, but we got to remind ourselves we made some dumb decisions. We've sown some seed, and now we're reaping the seed that we've sown. The cows have come home for some bad decisions we made. Folk got things to say. Well, wait a minute now. Jesus said, you're blessed when you suffer for things that I have caused you to do, not things your flesh got you into. There's a difference. There's a difference. So what do you do when it's self-inflicting? You just have to ride out the course, say I'm sorry, and believe God for mercy and grace, right? But in this case, and I won't have time to read, but just write down 1 Peter 3. I won't have time to read all of this. My time is almost up. But I want you to just he hear this. And, he, and, and, and who is he who will harm you if you become followers of what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you are blessed. I think Peter knows what he's talking about here. He goes on to say, and do not be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you for the reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear, having a good conscience. Somebody say a good conscience. That when they defame you as evildoers, those who revile you, your good conduct in Christ, may be ashamed. For it is better if it is the will of God to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. Now, I think the common denominator is this. You're going to suffer. There's going to be some persecution. There's going to be some attacks. But Peter said it would be better for you to suffer for doing good than for doing bad. Reminds me of the scripture when he was asked, was it Peter? No, no. When David was asked, uh, would you rather fall into the hands of man or would you rather fall into the hands of God? You're going you gonna, you gonna to get judged. And there's going to be some tough times ahead. You know what David said? Hey, let me fall into the hands of God. Because with these rascals right here, what I call the direct descendants of the Edomites, they're going to kill me twice. But God, if I fall into your judgment, maybe, just maybe, there'll be mercy enough for me to have a second chance. Let's go to number nine. Blessed are you when they revile, exclude, eat, persecute you, and say all kinds of evil falsely for my name's sake. Now, here's what I want to do. I got about three minutes left. I just want to share a show of hands. How many of you always say, Pastor, I know what that scripture's like. I've been faulty talked about. I just want to see your hands. Now, now keep those hands up. Fault he talked about for his sake. Let me see those hands. It's not a good feeling, is it? When someone puts their mouth on you and it's not true. The Bible calls that a false witness, bearing false witness. In fact, I believe it's one of the Ten Commandments, if I'm not mistaken, thou shalt not bear false witness. That's a serious indictment. That is a serious affliction. But Jesus had something he wanted to say to you and I. When people revile you, when they exclude you, it doesn't feel good to be rejected. It doesn't feel good to be abandoned. But Jesus says, I have a reward for you if you can hang in there. In fact, he says, when you are reviled, you are abusively criticized. You ever hear people talk about, oh, I just want to give you some constructive criticism? 
Uh, there's really no such thing as constructive criticism. This is a nice way of saying they, 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 they're trying to tell you how you really are. The word constructive criticism, it sounds corporate, but that, that's the domain of hill of beans, right? There's really no such thing as constructive criticism. They're criticizing you. All right? Straight up. But when you are reviled, put that on your broadcast this week, all right? And, I, and, and give me a like if you don't mind if, when you do that on, on, on your podcast there. There is no such thing as constructive criticism. They're criticizing you. Straight up. Right? But when you are reviled, it is an abuse of criticizing. It's one thing for you to miss the mark and someone call, it, call you out on it. But it's another thing for them to condemn you. To put a permanent marker on something that should have been a temporary change. Jesus says, blessed. In other words, again, Luke 6, blessed are you when men hate you and when they exclude you and revile you and they cast your name as evil. Uh, again, I don't know if this is registering with you right now, so I think I'd, I better close this message. But somewhere in this Western hemisphere, in this Western world, we just don't believe people hate us. Come with me to Israel. I've been to Israel 24 times. When you go to Israel, they know they got enemies. They are surrounded 650 times Muslim nations around this one strip of land the size of New Jersey called a democracy. They look at Israel as the little Satan, and they look at the United States as the big Satan. They know they're hated, and they live that life. We go to Israel all the time, and they got a bomb threat or got a little missile scare. It's no problem with them. They just go to the nearest missile uh, shelter and just kind of ride it out for the next two or three minutes. We, we didn't set our Hail Marys and went to heaven just that fact, because we know we ain't going to make it out of this one. They know what it's like to be hated. We don't. We think everybody's our friend. We think everybody likes us. We think everybody wants the best for us. But parents, would you teach your kids there are some evil people in this world? And not because you got a bad son or bad daughter, but there's just some wicked, evil people in the world. And not everybody means your child good thing. Not everybody means goodness for you. And you got to come to the conclusion that not everybody's your friend. May I help you out? And here's the problem. Many of you all now, all of a sudden, want to become this new phenomenon online. Now you got your own show. You got this. I'm not talking about you. But yeah, I'm talking about these new people who just all of a sudden become a quarantine. Now they want to be to cast me out online. Let me tell you one thing right now. If you can handle criticism, stay offline. All right? Because no matter what you say, somebody is going to come out the woodwork don't know what half of what they're talking about, ain't going to say something, and here you are going to shrivel up like a raisin and be pouting for the next 21 days. Well, you should have kept your behind offline in the first place. He who wants to lead the orchestra must first learn how to turn their back on the crowd. So you want to be cute and give some political comments, all right? Let's see how long this lasts. Hmm? And you talk about you saved, and you talk about you a Christian, and you talk about holiness. I want to see how that's going to jive with your demo, I mean, with, with your political self. Yeah, see how quiet y'all all got just now. That's what I'm talking about. Everybody has an opinion. Everybody has something on. So all I'm saying to you is this: make your calling and election sure. If you do these things, the Bible says you will not stumble. But if you're not sure in your calling, if you're not sure with your conviction, you do not want to get to a place where you are open prey for the enemy to criticize, to revile, and folk that hate you. It will get into your psyche, it will get into your mind, and all of a sudden you're bowing with depression, you're dealing with all type of issues. Why? Because you weren't prepared for the beatitude. I believe you have a voice, and you should share your voice. I believe you have a vision, and you should cast your vision. I believe God gives you value, and you should share your values. But be willing to be hated by all men. Luke concludes and says, just like the fathers did to the prophets of old. I wish I had time to go on, but he went on to say this. Woe unto them when men say nothing good about you. But he also said, woe to them when everybody says everything good about you. You have to be where man's opinions don't matter. I wish I had time to go a little further, but be attitudes are how your attitude should be. Let's stand to our feet. We got to get out of here and go home. Pastor Stevens, 
What should we do with all we've heard? Number one, hit your knees in prayer every day. Number two, stay in the Bible. Stay in the Word of God. Stay in the Word of God. Number three, think on these things. Somehow or another, the closer we get to the Lord, the, 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 the less I think we need to think. We, we, we come to church and check our brains in at the door. You are intelligent people, smart people, objective people, thinking people, analytic, logistical, uh, 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 logical. Think on the Word of God. Utilize the Word in your everyday life and practice. When you read the Bible, you read it for history, His story. But you also read it for, 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 for impartation, implementation. I can't read this like I'm reading some novel at Barnes & Noble. God, what is the word saying, and what is it saying to me, all right? Now that I know what it's saying to me, what will I do with what I've read? If you can't apply those principles in reading the Bible, you're simply taking a walk. I want your attitude to be like Jesus. I think Paul said it best, if I'm not mistaken. Paul says in Philippians 2, let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. Hmm? Bible goes on to say, who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but he made himself of no reputation. Is that right? And being found in his appearance, excuse me, taking the form of a bondservant and coming into the likeness of men and being found in his appearance as a man, he humbled himself. If you don't know how to humble yourself, God knows how to humble you. If you're having a hard time, ah, 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 I'm so proud and I don't know what to do myself. Okay, keep living. If you don't humble yourself, he knows exactly what your email address is. He knows exactly where you live. He knows exactly what time you're coming home. He knows how to humble But if you humble yourself, you became into the obedience to the point of death, even the death of the cross. What happens after that? The Bible goes on to say that this same Jesus who walked in humility, who humbled himself to the death of the cross, now the same Jesus God has exalted. God has raised up to where every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess, that he is Lord of all.